Hello, this is Charles Brewer, president of the Civil War Study Group at Lake of the Woods, Virginia. Welcome to this, the recording of our presentation on May 3rd, 2024. Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. By a show of hands, how many of you have had the opportunity to visit the James Madison Museum of Orange County Heritage on Caroline Street in the town of Orange? Ah, more than half. Great. Uh, our special guest tonight was responsible for the excellent curation and special exhibits that you've witnessed over the last 13 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Bethany Sullivan. And we have the earnest uh, work of uh, Greg Major, our board member, and his lovely wife, Kathy, uh, to thank for uh, putting this event together. So thank you very much. Now to our speaker. Our speaker this evening is John Mike uh, Priest, Michael Mike Priest, uh, and he's been studying the Civil War since he was in grade school when his parents took he and his brother uh, to Gettysburg every weekend. See, he's shaking his head, so that's true. Uh, he's a graduate of Loyola College in Baltimore uh, and Hood College, did you say it yet? And, and Hood College uh, in Frederick, also in Maryland, right? Uh, he's a retired school teacher uh, uh, in public high schools, uh, taught social studies, uh, and he told us a horror story or two. But at any rate, that's another story. Uh, he, he continues to be active in Civil War history as a lecturer and writer and a guide, and he's a licensed Antietam battlefield guide. He resides in Clear Spring, Maryland. And where's that? Uh, 18 miles west of Hagerstown. 18 miles west of Hagerstown. So, but in any event, I became familiar with his name almost 12 years ago when I bought the first of his books, Nowhere to Run. And then I bought Victory Without Triumph. So, first and second book of his two book series on the, the Battle of the Wilderness. And so I bring them tonight because what an opportunity to get the author to autograph the book. <laughs> Little did I remember that when I purchased the first book 12 years ago or whatever it was, uh, I purchased it as an autographed copy. <laughs> and it's in blue ink. He brought a black ink. Uh, uh, pen with him tonight and was concerned that uh, he needed to have it in blue, but I said it was just fine. Oh, just fine, thank you. But one of the things that I've always liked about these books is the fact that he, he gets down to individual stories. Uh, and we see a lot of, uh, it, it's interesting to see the strategy up on, uh, uh, up on our screen. As you see, our screen is not down, and so that means there won't be any slides. So we're going to have to pay attention, and he's going to <laughs> he's going to paint a word picture for us on uh, several people whose history that he's looked into. Now, this is the Battle of the Wilderness. He walked this land, uh, meaning uh, the author walked this land as part of his uh, research decades ago, and he's still with. As a matter of fact, I was on line today, and I saw a picture of you as a guide with a, like a hat, and uh, you looked a little bit younger. <laughs> but uh, don't, don't, didn't we all? Uh, but in any, rate, in any event. Uh, so his other books include Antietam, Soldier's Battle, The Soldier's Battle, Before Antietam, The Battle of South Mountain, uh, Into the Fight, Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, as a matter of fact, uh, he can be seen on Discovery Channel's Unsolved History episode on Pickett's Charge, which is based in part on his book. Uh, and then stand to it and give them hell. That's the second day at Gettysburg from Cemetery Ridge to Little Round Top. Sounds very invigorating uh, from that title. But anyway, any rate, he's a retired school teacher. He loves hiking Antietam uh, and South Mountain. Hit. <laughs> okay, vigorous youth. Uh, uh, and South Mountain and the walking trails uh, for the Bloody Lane. 
uh, uh, West Woods and the final attack trail at Burnside uh, Bridge, which of course is at Antietam, right? Uh, Mike specializes in small unit tactics, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, because he does so, uh, the uh, legendary historian Ed Bears referred to him as the Ernie Pyle of the Civil War soldier. Now, those of us of a certain age will know who Ernie Pyle was with respect to the Second World War. So uh, that is praise indeed, and I've said enough, so uh, Mike. I want to thank you all for inviting me out. Uh, it's good to get out in the public. I haven't been out in a while. Uh, it might show up tonight, but a, lo a little bit of background. I, I write history from the perspective of the men who got shot at. I write about generals when they get in the way <laughs> and are usually hit by a stray fire. Uh, too often we like to think that generals get hit by snipers. But that's hard to do when they didn't have infrared. <laughs> and, uh, and the bullets traveled in an arcing trajectory. So if you're on horseback behind the line with the training they didn't give men to shoot, uh, you're probably going to get hit by one of those. And probably where you won't want to discuss it. But I, I look at history as what it is, not what I would like it to be. I'm not politically correct. And that's because I don't want to get involved in propaganda. The other thing is, uh, having been raised by a father from Winchester, Tennessee, and a mother from Buffalo, New York, <laughs> okay, I didn't know that damn Yankee was two words until I went to college. <laughs> and that the South didn't win. <laughs> I also use Reb and Yank indiscriminately. I had relatives in both armies. 16th Tennessee Mounted Infantry under Bedford Forest. <clears throat> one got killed at Murfreesboro, Stones River. And the other one got captured and was a guest of the Union government on Rock Island, Illinois, who never reconstructed. And who named his son Robert E. Lee Priest because he wanted nothing to do with the Army of Tennessee. I had two relatives uh, from New York. My one great-grandfather told my grandma that he hauled cannonballs during the Civil War. So I looked up his record. He's the only Nicholas Klein spelled that way. And with Klein, any recruiter will spell it 500 different ways. But he was in the Company D, 50 York Heavy Artillery, got promoted to corporal in January 1863, and then lit out. <laughs> he hauled tail, too. The other one allegedly was at Gettysburg, because everyone who was in the war was at Gettysburg, even if they never knew where it was. Uh, that other one, Jonathan Geyer, G-E-I-E-R, and that's another thing. Don't let recruiters spell your name the way they think they hear it, especially if it's German. It'll come out nowhere near it. But he was in South Carolina and discharged with a disability after six months. He was nowhere near Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the great thing about the Civil War is there's a lot of good stories. And that's exactly what they are. That's why I don't go through the family tree. I don't need to know who was hanged from one. <laughs> <laughs> now, by way of, uh, well, advertisement, I have a new book coming out in July on the first day at Gettysburg on the first Army Corps. I didn't do the 11th because, for one thing, it was getting too big, and people don't like carrying paperweights around. <laughs> so that's going to be coming out. And I have four sets of my wilderness books over at the table over there. And I have no problem with signing them uh, for cash. No. <laughs> <laughs> now, my original intent was to draw comparisons. This is not exactly a planned talk. When I start with notes, they usually end up on the floor because I drop them. But studying history, Ed Barr said that the wilderness was the turning point of the war. I think it was in the East because it changed the nature of the warfare. Now out West, Vicksburg, they knew what a siege was. They knew what trench warfare was. But by 1864, 
the Confederates were able to dig trenches, rather formidable ones, within a matter of hours. This is a war where they're going to entrench because a lot of the army, except for some New York heavy artillery units in the Union Army, were veterans. And I learned a long time ago that veterans have a tendency to take cover. <laughs> I mean, even at Petersburg, the 6th Corps was ordered to go in, and the lead brigade laid down on the ground and let the new guys go over them. Why? Because we're not stupid. <laughs> and at the Wilderness and the Confederate Army, this one colonel, uh, the Confederates at the Wilderness were fighting in squads, much like they had at Antietam because they didn't have enough men there. And this colonel jumped in with a couple of fellows from North Carolina and said, follow me. No, sir. You're cowards. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> he went out, got wounded, and came back, and they said, see, we told you. <laughs> because in 1864, Confederates still elected their officers up to brigade level. You could get unelected. You could also accidentally get shot. And it probably did happen, but you know, when, when you romanticize things, <laughs> that's different. The other thing about this campaign, the Overland Campaign, it was the first time that armies in the East had been subjected to daily continuous warfare from May 4 through at least the 18th with the Wilderness through Spotsylvania. And it changed them. Almost the same way that the men in the trenches of World War I never forgot them. There are comparisons between the two that I'd like to make. In World War I, for the first time in our history, we get people writing stories and poetry with no holds barred. They're telling you like it's it. Now the Civil War did that too in some of the music. You know, you've got songs like Just Before the Battle, Mother, and all that. But in World War I, they didn't pull the punches. And when you get into some of the letters that have not been sanitized by the family, they cut out all the good parts, uh, you find Civil War veterans wrote the same thing. They carried the same memories with them just like the fellows that came home from World War II, like my father, who never left the war. And the guys from Vietnam, who because the public had never seen a real war, didn't know how to treat them. The men of World War I and the Civil War were the same. Soldiers are soldiers. And doesn't matter what army they're in, except for the Japanese, because they were almost suicidal. But even with the Germans, uh, in World War I, you get a realism that is going to get one of them banned, Eric Maria Remarque, when he wrote All Quiet in the Western Front. Hitler didn't like it. So he came here and wrote more anti-war books. But I want to share just a couple of items from World War I and then come up with examples from the wilderness. You see, the tactics look good on maps, but Field Marshal von Molka, Prussian army, wrote in the 1870s that no plan survives the first shot. And the most dangerous people on the field are new troops who will actually listen to orders whether they make sense or not. And, and that is true. You find them time again. The, fifth, uh, the New York heavies, you know, 1,500 men strong, and, and they get attacked by Law's Alabama Brigade and just scatter because they were trained as heavy artillery. Giving a guy a rifle or a musket doesn't mean he knows how to handle it. It's like Abe Lincoln when he was defending Jack Armstrong. Uh, the fellow that he tussled with, and the lawyer, the prosecuting attorney, got up and said, do you mean you pointed the end of that weapon at the fellow and pulled the trigger? And Lincoln objected, sir, if he'd aimed it the other way, he'd have killed himself. <laughs> New troops get like that. 
just a, a couple of brief things. Eric Maria Remarque, in All Quiet in the Western Front, wrote one of the most gripping introductions of 52 words. This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. I will try simply to tell of a generation of men who even though they may have survived the war, were destroyed by it. And that last one is a little bit of a paraphrase. Because they carry that with them. And then, by the way, the, the fellow that wrote that remark served on both fronts in World War I. And his book is actually an autobiography written as a novel. Then there was Wilfred Owen. In World War I, they have to deal with something they call trench fever, uh, the thousand yard stare, shell shock. And a number of your officers, particularly in the British Army, were sent to the rear lines to rehabilitate. One of them was a young fellow named Wilfred Owen. And I'm not going to read the whole poem, but he makes a, a final, in the final stanza, writes, If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as cud, of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is good and wonderful to die for one's country. Owen got killed in the last week of the war. A comrade of his was a fellow named Siegfried Sassoon. He survived the war, but he carried its memories with him. He wrote a book called uh, Life of an Infantry Officer After the War. And he wrote a thing called Suicide in the Trenches about a young soldier who had gone too long without good food, crawling with lice, who killed himself. And in the last paragraph it reads, you smug-faced crowds with kindling eye who cheer when soldier lads march by, sneak home and pray you'll never know the hell where youth and laughter go. It almost, it, it's an exact representation of what these young men went through. Some of them were, none of them were young, not when they got out of it. In the wilderness. By 1864, the veterans in both armies had become something of fatalist. They knew that one day they weren't going to come out of it. And it was a lot like the British saying that for every bullet there is a billet. And the French infantry, the poilu, looking at cameramen and saying, go ahead and take a picture of the dead. Now, I know it's somber, but you come away with an appreciation of what they paid so that we could gather here. And when you sent me a copy of the monument out by the church, it read, it, it's ironic, it's the same sentiments. Hundreds and hundreds of young men or older men will never know where they're laid to rest until the judgment day. So how did it change these men? Well, first of all, and I'm going to go in line, there was a, a, a cavalry fight on the cat hopping road. Now, I learned the hard way from doing work down here, it's the cat hopping road. If you go in saying Catharpin, they don't know where you are from. <laughs> okay? Comes from the English. The H-A-R-P-I-N is hopping. And you can track your dialect back to a county in New England. <laughs> so, you know, the guy named Charles Chapin in the 1st Vermont Cavalry, they got charged by the 12th Virginia, in which charge their colonel lost control of his horse and it just kept going with him on it. He is writing a letter home as a prisoner of war on the way back 
to Belle Isle or worse. And he's griping because he got captured by a Virginia cavalryman wearing a blue uniform. <laughs> it wasn't Confederate blue, it was blue. You want to get in trouble at any battlefield, tell them that the Confederates wore blue uniforms. In the Maryland Cayman campaign, I know they did. Matter of fact, uh, who was it? Uh, Maxie Gregg, wild man. South Carolina Brigade, all 900 men, they were wearing blue uniforms. That's how they captured or drove off a new Union regiment. They were still wearing them nine months later at Gettysburg and ran into cavalry who didn't shoot at them for the first 50, until they got within 50 feet when they dropped it and put up the Confederate flag. Well, in 1864, the Confederate staff officers were telling their men, don't wear blue uniforms, don't wear parts of them. No. <laughs> Uh, just before, uh, May 9th, uh, uh, outside of Spotsylvania, a Virginia Cavalry Company charged Breathed's battery, artillery, and made like they were going to capture it, so the Yankees charged and it stopped. It wasn't. They were just throwing stuff away so they could escape. They did do it. Was it fair? No. Was it right? No. And some guys will say, well, they wouldn't have done it because it was against regulations. I told that to a lady from New York who knew nothing about the Civil War. And she said, well, they were rebels, weren't they? <laughs> Seriously, it beats going naked. There were other hard times, too. The 25th Virginia was at Saunders Field on the morning of the 5th afternoon. And there was a fellow named Phil Kreitz in Company B who decided to go out and loot two corpses, Yankee corpses, of their good knapsack. And he got out there and a sharpshooter shot him down. Severely wounded him. He wasn't dead. He was thrashing about. And a fellow in the company named Sam Lynch volunteered with three other men to bring him in. And Lynch's best friend, John King, told him, don't go. <coughs> they ignored him. The minute they, he bent over to uh, help Kreitz, the sharpshooter shot him, mortally wounded him. It shocked King so badly, he never remembered if the three men who went with Lynch came off the field, or if they rescued Christ. But he would not go out there and rescue his dying friend. He said, his death hurt me worse than any other in the war, but he wasn't going to risk his life to go out and rescue someone who was already dying. That's a reality, and that's hard things for men to deal with. I mean, I ran into an account like that in my book on the first day. This one fellow uh, who owed this corporal some money, best friend, got shot. And he was thinking of uh, going and getting the money, but he said, no, nah, under the circumstances, he can have it. They had to make decisions, and they were hard ones. Generals were not exempt from getting hit in the wilderness. And one of the final attacks by the 5th Corps against Saunders Field. Two men of the 83rd Pennsylvania caught Generals Yule, Early, Rhodes, and John M. Jones in the Orange Turnpike dismounted. Everyone got to their horse, including Jones. Early's nephew, Robert, got shot dead as an aide trying to help him. And these two Pennsylvanians cornered John M. Jones and demanded that he surrender. And he said, no, I don't surrender to men of lower rank. So they shot him, stole a sword. <laughs> I, had a, I had a friend in the uh, 82nd Airborne in Sicily. And uh, he, they were shooting rifle grenades down the muzzles of Italian tanks. Why? Because the Italian tanks weren't well made to begin with. 
But he blew this thing up and this German officer calls out, along with his German shepherd. Now Freddy was my height. And the dog jumped up on its hind feet to go after Freddy. He just kicked him in the stomach and knocked him out cold. Dog followed him everywhere after that. The German officer refused to surrender. I will not surrender to an American of low rank. Fine. Freddy put the bayonet on his weapon and just inserted it at the base of the spine enough that the German knew it was there and walked him back to headquarters that way. Things don't change in the military when you're in those situations. They don't. Uh, they, they have, they, they get a sense of humor that's kind of twisted. They laugh at things that aren't funny, but that's funny because it's not happening to them. Saunders Field again. That was a hot spot. There was so much stuff that went on there. There was a lull in the fighting. And in the retreat across the field, a Union soldier fell in to the, the drainage in the middle of the field, followed immediately by a Confederate who fell in on top of him. Bullets are flying everywhere. They got in an argument. <laughs> You're my prisoner. No, I'm not. You're my prisoner. And they crawled out of, into the open and got in a fist fight. <laughs> Everyone ceased fire until the Yankee knocked the rev out and they both fell in the ditch again. It was all over. <laughs> People do that. Well, General Joseph G. Bartlett, Brigade Commander, Fifth Corps, they get into the Confederate works on the, other, on the Confederate side of the field and get driven out. Bartlett decides, at a full gallop, to leap his horse over the ditch. It was mid-air when it got hit in the rear with a 58 caliber ball. Now that's like getting hit with a sledgehammer. I have been, I know what it's like. My wife missed the post. <laughs> I'm serious. She was out there, we were trying to loosen the post, and I said, when I, that's not the old routine, when I nod my head hit it, she swung sideways and missed the post. She thought it was funny. I, I didn't. <laughs> but I know what it's like. Well, Bartley was midair, the horse got hit, somersaulted with him on board over onto the other bank, and he was still on board. He crawled out from under the horse and staggered away. How he lived, no one knows. I don't know if you've ever had a horse fall on you, but it's not pleasant. Or have one sit on a barbed wire fence while you're riding it. <laughs> That's not pleasant either. Uh, but the men thought that was hilarious. Really. There was a, another young fellow, and again, Saunders Field, there's so many different things that happened. But in the 20th Maine, there was a, a, a private named Theodore Garish. And he was running for his life into the pine thicket on the federal side. And he got hit in the leg and just fell face first to the dirt. And he looked around and the dry grass and the leaves and the pine needles were on fire. He decided, I gotta get out of here. So he checked to see if he still had a leg. The bullet had gone through his ankle. The foot was still attached. And he got a bright idea, I'm gonna run out of here. He took a one step in a run and fell face forward. Got up, did it again, fell face forward. He learned quickly that if he kept his leg taut, he could limp faster than he could run. And he escaped. Eric Mary Remark in All Quiet in the Western Front wrote about the same thing. I've seen a soldier without his feet running to get into the trench to escape the fire. It's amazing what people can do when the adrenaline is going. Now, the, the, the case in Nam where this jeep got ambushed on a trail and the men got out, picked it up on four corners, turned it around and drove it back. <laughs> Only adrenaline, okay? They survived. And there was a, a, there, there's so many little things. On the evening of May 6th, you know, the woods have been burning. It's the smell of pine pitch and dry leaves and everything else. 
And in the 11th Corps, they were told you could not light coffee fires. Why? They don't want the enemy to know you're there. It's like in World War I. If you wanted to go and light a cigarette, they called it a fag. Okay? You put a blanket over your head and laid down to smoke it. Okay? Or if you had a pipe, you put a cover over it. Because the snipers could see the smoke and they didn't instinctively shoot at it. So you got that kind of stuff going on. Well, there was this Irishman, and remember, if you're always going to have a good joke, make it an Irishman. <laughs> the Irish are, are, are unique people. They can laugh at themselves because if they don't, someone is going <laughs> to. So they're great at putting themselves down and enjoying every second of it. Well, this Irishman was so fond of his pipe, he slept with it. Literally, they thought, this man's not right. He put tobacco in it, sitting quietly, and lit the match, and that's when a sniper shot him. He lost his pipe and two fingers on his left hand. And the men thought it was really funny. It could have been worse. I mean, that's like when, when doing duty in World War I, if you smoked a cigarette, you had to keep it covered because they'd aim at the light. <clears throat> but uh, he, he parted with his pipe and it really upset him. The 56th Massachusetts, brand new Massachusetts regiment, had a captain in it named Z. Boylston Adams. Adams had been in the war from the beginning. He was at Gettysburg at the Rocky Knoll, the Rocky Hill, with the 5th Massachusetts Infantry, where he was an assistant surgeon. There, there was a marker. There's still a marker on the rock where his field hospital was. You know, they're about 20 feet behind the firing line and surrounded by boulders. That's a real good place to set it up. But anyway, he was going into the wilderness. His colonel, a fellow named Bartlett, who had problems. Bartlett lost his right leg to a skirmisher on the peninsula. Didn't stop him. He had a wooden leg, and every time he got new men in, he'd run them through the drill, using his leg as the rifle and standing on one foot. Going into this, he got hit in the head, first thing out. Survived it. At the Battle of the Crater, he went into the crater, landed in mud, and when they dragged him out, his legs were still back there. He went to prison, rough prison, without him. Now he's going to die within a few years after the war at the age of 39. All right. He was kind of battered because before that, he'd gotten shot in the chest, too. And chest wounds were only 99.9% .9 failed. And they, they, they worked on him by cauterizing him shut. So these guys were tough. Well, Adams, he's going in, and a bullet hit him in the right kneecap. Oh. He went to take a step and didn't realize it, but he got another bullet at the same time, same leg. And he's laying on the ground, place, place is getting overrun, and these Confederates walk up to him, and they're thinking of robbing him. Well, their colonel was with him. You're not going to rob him. And what shocked Adams is that the men touched their colonel and spoke to him without asking permission. In the Union Army, you had to ask permission to speak to a commanding officer. That's like in the movie Glory. That's accurate. Why? Well, they stopped electing their officers back in 61. But they're looking at him and they're talking with him. He got put in a, a, a two-wheeled ambulance and hauled down the road by the Confederates, and a shell blew one of the wheels off and threw him out in the road. So they picked him up and carried him to the hospital, and the next thing you know, he's waking up. It's dark. Something's hitting him right here. 
He can't figure out what it is. And he must have moved because the surgeon looked under the table and said, oh, I thought you were dead hours ago. Oh, they were operating on the guy on the table and that's what woke him up. During the Civil War, they could do remarkable things with medicine. They shortened his leg. They called it resecting. And they made sure he got special shoes for that right foot. He survived the war. But these guys were tough. I mean, I wouldn't want to go to him and have him make a decision like, does this hurt? He could care less. I mean, you know, surgeons had a bad sense of humor. Really bad. And they, they were the same way in World War I. In World War I, they were actually working with, with brain surgery, trying to. And they had a magnetic probe that they used. And it reminds me of an old Far Side cartoon, sick as ever, where they're working on a guy and the doctor's going, hey, look what happens when you do this. <laughs> That's what happened. That's how they learned. But they could also, they did put guys back together. They, they would put the piece of bone back in, so the scalp over it. Now, he might not act right after that. I mean, there was a fellow who, uh, 16th Connecticut, they found him three days later on the field, and they put him back together. Only thing was, he couldn't hear. So they sent him home. He got hit by a train in front of his house. Oh. Bummer. <laughs> First South Carolina Volunteers. Now, Lee had a sharpshooter battalion. He'd had it since early in the war. They only had four scoped rifles. Four. The rest were British Whitworths and Enfields. An Enfield in good hands, you could adjust the sight for a thousand yards and it would put a ball through three inches of pine board. Well, Barry Benson left behind some beautiful material that his daughter edited when the book got published. I want to find the unedited part because there's some stuff in there I think that would be really interesting. Mom wouldn't like it, but I think it'd be interesting. <laughs> the problem with combat is you don't want to let the enemy know you're there. It's not good either for them or for you. Well, in World War I, the British wouldn't stop playing their bagpipes. <laughs> and artillerists zeroed in on the noise. With the Confederates, it was the rebel yell. Now, I've heard recordings of it done in the 30s by the veterans. It's the only thing that a Pekingese will haul at. Because <laughs> mine started hauling. The Confederates were told in what was later Greg's South Carolina Brigade, not Greg, uh, McGowan's, do not yell when you charge. Why? It travels through the woods and the Union soldiers will fire at it. Even if it's not the right direction, they'll fire at it. And Benson wrote about, some fool started it, and we did not get very far, because the Federals knew what was going on. Add to that the trenches. Let me see if I'm missing something here. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, John M. Stone was a colonel, a brigade commander in the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, North Carolinians. And his men had got really shot and shot up really bad on the set. And D.H. A.P. Hill, D.H. Hill got deported to South Carolina because Lee cleaned house after he had him. He didn't like people who argued with him. Yet he kept Longstreet. Longstreet was the only one who would argue with him. I'll tell you about that one too. But anyway, he was telling, Hill was saying, that was brilliant what you did, just brilliant. And he looked at Hill and he said, you give the honor to my men. And he then turned around and started crying because he'd lost so many for nothing. That's the problem. People get, get a hopeless feeling. Now, artillery. Many people don't talk about artillery in the wilderness. They had it. 
They didn't know what they were shooting at, but they had it. And on the north end of the field, there was a battery that had James guns. James guns were smoothbore six pounders that they decided to rifle. And it fired a 10 to 14 pound solid shot or explosive round. Well, the 49th New York was up at the angle where it got turned on, on the 6th, right where the, the, the coal pumper mine road it forms 90 degree. They're, they're in the woods. They haven't dug in yet. They haven't entrenched. And con Captain John F. E. Plogstead, a German, very prominent German from Buffalo, decided to lead against a huge oak tree with his back to the Confederates and his men in front. Well, that didn't quite work. A 10-pounder bolt, that's a non-explosive, went through the oak tree like it was made of butter and hit him. He lost his left arm and his right arm and leg were smashed. That same round burrowed into the ground and struck a fellow named John Weiss. Company B 49th with German, yeah, one fourth, of the, one fourth of the city. And it threw him six feet in the air, kept on going, went under First Sergeant Gus Meyer, knocked him up off the ground and rolled him all over the place. Well, Plogstead lasted half an hour. Weiss didn't make it, but Meyer did. He didn't have a scratch on him just a few bruises. Now, the problem with artillery in the woods, uh, especially if it's smooth war, is that they bounce between the trees. The 49th got hit by another round that came in from the flank. It went through the front rank lying down, hit a tree and ricocheted back through the second one. And one of the guys lifted up his head to see what was going on, that was it. They remembered that. They, they remembered how bad it felt. The, the other thing with trenches, who was it uh, on the staff of Meade? I keep forgetting his name. Lyman. He said, don't give a rebel 24 hours to dig anything. You'll never take it. Pegram's brigade came on the field on the bleed on the 5th and they had never entrenched before. They were entrenching. And they did something else. They cleared a field of fire 50 yards away. Just cut the trees down. And then they blazed the trees on the side facing them. Because that white blaze would show up. If someone's coming toward them, when that blaze disappears, that's when you open fire. Six Maryland found out about that hard way. So when the Union troops defend the Brock Road, they, play, they don't play trees, but they cut a clear field of fire and put guns behind the earthworks. The problem was the, the guns, when they fired, set the earthworks on fire. That made it really bad for the crew. This guy, see what they would do you know, they have in the movies, they always run the ammunition. Uh, uh you run the ammunition and you stack it next to the gun. You can load quicker. But the heat was so intense, the, the number one man on the gun, the fellow who rammed it home, remembered distinctly when the powder bags ignited. Yeah, he wasn't hurt, but all his clothes were burned off. They thought that was humorous. I mean, I was talking with a World War I veteran one time as a kid, and he said they were going down a road, and a shell burst behind them. It took all the clothes off the back of the guy. The front was still there. He wasn't hurt. It's what you call, thank goodness, someone's watching out for me. There was a Marine in World War II that happened, too. He was in Guadalcanal sitting down with his mess tin, and a Japanese mortar round went through the tin and landed between his knees and didn't go off. It wasn't hard to follow him. He left the trail. 
<laughs> Very evident. He left the trail. He no, didn't even use a machete. Now, in regard to James Longstreet, James Longstreet is perhaps one of my favorite generals. He gets a bad rap after the war, thanks to Jubal Early, who insisted, no insult intended, that Virginia won the war without all those other people. Uh, he hated Longstreet. He never forgave him for letting Lee down at Gettysburg, which when you really look at it, he didn't. Uh, Lee's engineer, Johnston, did a bad job. But that's another story, too. They're still arguing about that. But Longstreet was respected. Lee liked him because he would argue with Lee. And Lee generally didn't like that. Lee liked being right. And it's no fault. It's just that that's the way he was. On the late afternoon of July, no, July, I'm thinking ahead, May 6th, Longstreet and his staff are riding down the Orange Plank Road. And there's a lot of smoke going on. Behind him is Kershaw's South Carolina Brigade wearing black uniforms. They had just gotten a load from Prussia. They were wearing Prussian uniforms. The, the neat thing about a Confederate uniform, it's about as consistent as any two McDonald ice cream cones. <laughs> They're no two alike. But anyway, uh, on the other side of the road was Billy Mahone's men, who had just counterattacked the 56th Massachusetts, and there was all kinds of confusion. In the smoke, someone apparently in the 41st Virginia thought they saw cavalry, and they opened fire. The Carolinians, South Carolinians, were about to open fire when someone from the 6th Virginia ran out and went, no, 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 don't do that. Uh, Longstreet got hit, I think it was in the throat, and it, under the left arm too, and it lifted him up off the saddle. Uh, he lost Micah Jenkins, killed dead, and an aide. What struck me the most is that when he was being carried to the rear in an ambulance, Confederates actually had ambulances on the farm wagon, and Lee rode up and asked who was in there. And they said, General Longstreet. Lee was in tears because he relied on Longstreet. Longstreet marched his corps and double columns of four through the wilderness at night and got to the Plank Road just in time. Only Longstreet would have pulled that off. And Lee had to replace him with, uh, not George, George got killed, uh, Anderson, Richard Anderson, who wasn't the same caliber. You see, sometimes when we rewrite history, we put our heroes up on a pedestal and we'll believe whatever someone wrote, like the official records. I use them because they're useful, but I'll check it against what the guys on the ground saw first. Okay? Really, that's two different pictures there. You know? It's like Willie and Joe when they ran their Jeep into a statue of Mussolini and ruined it. Well, I'll tell the old man, we made contact with the enemy and walked to our objective. <laughs> that's the way it goes. That's what made this so, that's what I find so fascinating about it. That, that you know, there's so many similarities. In World War I, during all the shellings, and there were massive shellings, men in the trenches could see birds flying above them, above the shells. That same account came out of the wilderness. Um, men remembered hearing the birds chirping at night as if nothing had happened. And veterans do talk about that, too. Guadalcanal, they talked about it. So it's not so far away as we think. One other thing, and I've got to check 
because I lose track of time. Am I doing okay? Yeah, I told, well, he said he's going to go like this. <laughs> That's fine. On the first day of the battle, the Pennsylvania Reserves, one regiment, I think it was the fifth, got ahead of all the other infantry on the Parker Store Road and got captured by one company of the 61st Georgia. Because the Georgians spread themselves out and started yelling commands all over the place, which in the woods echoed really good, and the Pennsylvanians surrendered without firing a shot. The Georgians lined them up and marched them back to the rear with their weapons. <laughs> and when they got back, they were surprised. We got surrounded by a brigade. No, oh, 30, 40 men? They were really embarrassed. But that's the thing. Soldiers do take initiative. You know, but never share a foxhole with someone braver than you are. Okay? <laughs> you know, go and inspire us. You know, uh, uh, Colonel. Mm. Anyway, what I find about this is the stories that they told that makes everything make sense. The tactics, <clears throat> the Union Army in the wilderness tried to maintain its formations. Confederates weren't. That was not fair. But they started that at Antietam, where you know if you had a Confederate regiment of 50 men, that's a big regiment. I mean, First Virginia had 17, eight of them were officers. <laughs> so you think a minute, they adapted their tactics to fit the situation. And Lee used his sharpshooters very effectively. 300 of them from all the different regiments. And it was a Georgian with a scoped rifle, by the way, that got Sedgwick. He wrote about it after the war and described it exactly as the Union troops saw it. And uh, that's when, you know, Sedgwick, of course, said they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. He wasn't aiming at one. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the, the, when I get into those stories, I see them, I understand them. I, I find out that, you know, they're not that different from us. They just didn't have the words to describe it. Final thing, a good book to read. I think his name is Wilkerson. Mother, may you never see the sights I have seen. That is one of the best regimentals I've ever read. It's, it's really moving, it's great. So, questions, because I'll be glad to take them. If I don't know, I'll tell you. If you insist, I'll tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> okay? But seriously, questions. I have no problem with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just absorbed it all. Huh? I've just been absorbing it all. It's been wonderful. Well, the problem is, generals, when they write about battles, have a reputation. Frontline officers might have one. The enlisted man, I mean, my dad made sergeant three times in the corps, <laughs> private four. He had a problem with authority. <laughs> so really, I mean, they've got nothing to lose. And a lot of the men are writing about it because they got to get it all, they got to get out of their minds. They had PTSD, no one knew quite what it was. <laughs> Okay, and the fact that so many of them survived. We probably have not seen one-fourth of any of the things that they wrote because a lot of them wouldn't write about it. <coughs> I, I mean, my friend in the 82nd at all, all three jumps and my dad, they wouldn't talk about it unless they were drinking. And the irony of that is, is that they drank to forget. But the more they drank, the more they remembered. <laughs> These guys had a problem with alcoholism, morphine addiction, opiate addiction. <coughs> I mean, the, the fact that so many did survive. And without the medical treatment we have today. It's a tribute to them, but at the same time it's sad. They came back to these battlefields to put up monuments. Not a one of them is to the living. 
the, what I call cenotaphs, is that the correct word? They're memorials to those that they left behind. And so many of them wanted to be left behind too. A lot of them had uh, survivor's remorse. They just didn't have the terminology. So again, when you get into history, it's about the people that are in it. But if you have any other questions, oh, did I talk about this already? You mentioned it, yeah. Thank you, because my memory's laughing. <laughs> Sorry, a question for you. Yes. Uh, sir, earlier you mentioned that, um, you know, from May 4th to about May 18th was continuous fighting for both wilderness and Spotsylvania mm -hmm. Fort House, of course, uh, and, and obviously terrible fighting, as you've been alluding to. So I'm curious if you could comment on, at the end of Spotsylvania, for both armies, how is the morale for the North and for the Confederates? I'd be curious if you have any insights. From to the research I've seen, particularly with the 49th New York, they didn't call Grant a butcher. These guys were pretty hardened. The, the 49th went in with 384 men and walked out of Spotsylvania with 114 and only four officers. They could see the end of the war. They could see that they were doing something, that this was going to end it. The Confederates, 64, you're going to find desertions rising, particularly with the North Carolinians. See, North Carolina, Virginia, all the Confederate states, but South Carolina raised at least one white regiment for the Union Army from that state. Virginia, until West Virginia came along, supplied 40 units, cavalry, infantry, artillery. Because at Antietam, it was the 7th Virginia that fought the 16th Mississippi. <laughs> now, uh, Texas had three regiments. East Tennessee, North Carolina in particular, supplied a bulk of Longstreet's command. And they were really getting torn apart. They were really, the mountain people in particular, Appalachia, now they call it Appalachia, but when I was a boy it was Appalachia. Uh, the mountain people in particular were very divided. They still had the divisions from the Revolutionary War of regulators, I don't want to be involved. The valley, with all the brethren, they didn't want to be involved. So, you know, they, they'd had, a, North Carolina suffered just terrible rate of desertion. They said it was up the spout. But that's why when you get to Spotsylvania, you have a Confederate division uh, with a thousand men in it. That, that's what, 18 regiments? That's why they were merging brigades into regiments? I mean, you look at it, you know, you got all these regiments, right? How many? Oh, there's two here, two here, three here. You know, the Confederacy was getting worn out, and that's what Grant wanted to do. So, yeah, I think the Confederates were worse off after this. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. You mentioned all these letters. How do you find them? Are there anthologies? In okay. <laughs> <clears throat> when I wrote this, you didn't have the internet, mm -hmm. so Chapel Hill, University of Virginia. Uh, oh, come on. Library of Virginia? Now. Duke. You went to them and got in their repositories. Now, if you go to Columbia to get in theirs, you got to know the name of the individual. It's still run like your local uh, historical, no insults intended, your local <laughs> historical society. Oh, yeah, we got those letters. And you open up the file cabinet and they're all loose in the bottom. So I had to do that kind of work. The great thing about the internet is you can go online, and particularly with Duke and Chapel Hill and that, they've digitized a lot of the material. And the copyright has expired. Really, like, you can't use that. Well, if it was written in 1905, I can. It expired. But you should, you know, quote the sources and all that. But yeah, it's still out there. It's amazing. You can go online and look up the National Tribune, which was a post-war veterans paper, <clears throat> clear up from 1867, I think, 
up through 1914. It was still active in 1941, but there weren't enough veterans to write for it. There's some great first-hand accounts in there, but you have to go through and check to make sure they really are real, because some of them made up some great stories. I found a terrific one in the wilderness, and then realized it was a sham. Uh, no, really, it's all out there. It's just a matter of how much do you want to put into it. One of the things I do if someone does contact me is that if they're looking for information, I can try to find the source for you. I, lo I love doing research. Your writing's a pain. <laughs> I like doing the research. And, and so, yes, it's much easier now. You don't have to wear gloves. You can go to the National Archives. <sighs> it's neat, but you gotta wait, and you gotta wait. And don't stand up on the chair with the camera to shoot something you put on the floor. You will get thrown out. <laughs> I saw a guy do that. <laughs> He's gone. Uh, no, it, it's, there's so much available to us as Americans that we don't tap. And again, the research is fun. <laughs> So, how are we doing? Any others quick before I get, oh, I'm gonna get it. No, no. <laughs> He's getting up, I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> Can I have the uh, microphone? Well, I, I'm gonna have one of these. I want to go and flip that I will, yes. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll walk home with it. Leave it. <laughs> yeah. yes, I, yes, I, thank you so much, Mike. That was uh, uh, great. Uh, and uh, there are still a few copies of his book over there. So uh, uh, the books are priced uh, and then autographs for $10 more. No, I'm uh, kidding. <laughs> Did you want ten dollars? No. <laughs> Don't ever ask me if I want it, but yeah. Oh, okay, but in any event, uh, thank you so much. And, and speaking of the internet, uh, like I said, I've had these books for like ten or twelve years. I was interested in finding this guy uh, uh, as a speaker, and you go on the internet and you see some uh, listings that uh, ended up being like uh, the publishers, etc. Short bio, great but how do you contact? I didn't want to go through authors, representatives, and things like that and not get calls back. So I went to whitepages.com, <laughs> typed in his name, and also I figured that he lived in Maryland, and I got a hit. And I'm, I'm so glad I did that. So thank you very much. tonight uh, and uh, for supporting our activities. Uh, we have a, a full schedule remaining uh, for June through uh, November of this year, so check out our website, civilwarstudygroup.org, uh, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you very much. Before you go, please remember to visit our website often, civilwarstudygroup.org. We make every attempt on a regular basis to provide informative content. Thank you for visiting, and God bless.